My uh, title today is The Most Amazing Idea in the History of Ideas. So we'll see if I can convince you of that. I'm going to be reading uh, uh, from uh, Romans 3.28 so, and forward. So if you'd like to follow in your Bible, you're welcome to turn to Romans 3, verse 28. You can also follow on the screen as I, as I walk through this. It'll feel like a Bible study. In fact, this sermon ca- comes literally on the tales of a Bible study I did at my mom's senior living apartment building uh, this last Wednesday. So as I came away from that experience with those wonderful folks, I thought this would be exactly what I want to say to you. So uh, my name is Ron Johnson. I'm the son of Elaine Johnson Matson. Uh, Melvin and uh, Ethel Matson were foundational members here at the church over the years going way back. Uh, my mom was able to convince her sisters to come. I think she paid them to come today. <laughs> so, no? Okay. So, uh, Dick and Darla Wexler are here, Donna and Brian Crone, and Janet Perupski as well. Those are all Matsons. So, um, in fact, my mom got married on this very aisle in 1957, the same month. So, f- 64 years ago, she walked down this aisle. So. I have been coming here as a lad over the years, and uh, I remember being up in that back room and acting up for a Sunday school teacher a long time ago. I I don't know who it was, so she has a crown in heaven, I remember, for that one. We're simply going to work our way through these paragraphs, or just a couple of paragraphs in Romans, uh, following Paul's thought about what he meant. And by the way, I think that's the best way to read the Bible, is to put yourself, pretend to be in the original position of the reader, the original reader, and think about how the original writer would have liked to have been understood. Uh, And that's what we'll do. In fact, as we get into Romans, let's pretend and time travel back to when it first came out, the book of Romans. Go back to A.D. 57. Jesus has died and resurrected about 25 years previous to this. And now we live about 1,400 miles away from where Jesus grew up. And we've begun in Rome to gather weekly to celebrate the meaning of Jesus' resurrection and how that has changed, that event has changed our worldview. This group, by the way, probably has been meeting for a long time, even before they heard of the name of Jesus, because this was a common thing back in the Roman uh, Empire, that people would gather to worship the God of Israel and that study would take place through the Old Testament or or what we today call the Old Testament. This comes out of the synagogue movement that kind of started between the two testaments. So they would gather together at this point in world history and, and we know that they were gathering over the name of Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, Now, What we also have to realize if we were to time travel back into this day is how full of gods this world was. On every street corner you could see either a temple, an altar, or an idol. So as you traveled to, on foot probably, to this small group, and by the way, uh, commentators think that the church at Rome was about 100 people. So let's pretend we are them. This is the church at Rome. And as you traveled to church today, you would have passed by numerous idols and things. And people, someone, a friend may have said, where are you going? And you'd say, I'm going to worship Jesus. Well, who is that? Well, there's your chance to explain why Jesus means what he does to you. And you'd say, I believe he is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. And can you imagine how they'd look at you? Zeus is greater than Jesus. Apollo, I mean, there's his huge temple right there. And you're saying that this Nazarene, who hardly has a reputation even by this point, he is the God of gods, and you'd have a chance to explain the story of Jesus. But here is now the constant challenge that really caused the book of Romans. And that is that in this audience of the original group there at Rome, half, in fact, I'll use you guys as the example, half the room was Jewish, The other half was non-Jewish or Gentile. And these two uh, tribal backgrounds were so different that, again, if you had walked in, the first question you would have said is, what what are two very different groups of people doing in the same room? 
And that, of course, would have given us an understanding or given us the chance to describe what has now been happening since Jesus' death. Uh, never, never before, this is, some, this is by itself one of the most amazing ideas that we can mention coming into our sermon here. Never before in world history had a religion attempted to cross tribal boundaries. This is the first attempt. I wonder in my natural mind whether Paul thought he would be successful in his ministry to get Jews and Gentiles to get along. And Rome is one of those attempts. So uh, back in that day, this is the way you stayed in your lane. You worship the God of your fathers. And now we are trying to put together something that has never been attempted. So here comes this letter to us today. And uh, by the way, it probably was read to the group. Uh, about 10% of the population could read and write at this point. Only if you were a businessman or an international tradesman would you ever learn to read. And so most of you would have been illiterate. Doesn't mean you're not smart. It just means you didn't read. And so you would sit here and someone, it looks like it's Phoebe, Romans 16, 1, was commissioned to stand up in front of the church and read the letter of Romans in one sitting, by the way. So I won't do that to you, but that's what it would have been like. And by the way, she was expected, if we understand how these uh, professional readers were treated, she was expected to have pre-read the letter and to have, to have stopped at various points in the letter and asked if there were any questions. Or you, as an audience member, could stand up and say, what did he, Paul, mean by what he said? And she was expected to discourse with both the letter and the person asking the question. So if, uh, if I stop and say any questions, I do mean that, because that's what she would have done as well, all right? Um, so let's drop into this uh, part of Romans 3.28 is where we'll start. And I'm just going to move my way through these verses and explain them as Phoebe probably would have in her first attempt through this book. We are going to see as we go through it an amazing idea unfold, something we have gotten possibly used to, but it was new to them. And new ideas always take time to sink in, don't they? Verse 28, Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude, that means everything up to Romans 3.28 is angling toward this verse, that a man is justified, that, and, and that word just means to be right or proper, especially now in this context, in the sight of God, by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Let's unpack those two words, faith and law. Obviously, that's what they would have wondered about. And I think, well, let's put it this way. Faith in their world, I think, made a lot of sense, and it's our world that has trouble with it. It's one of those words in English that has kind of lost its moorings, and so now we use the word faith when we say, I have faith that, or I believe that the Vikings will win today. It's not really a word that means I know. It means I think, I wish, I hope, and I'll put my money on something I'm not too quite. That's, that's how the world has come to use the word faith. But in, and this is a study unto its own, but I'll, but I'll summarize it very quickly. In the Bible, the word faith meant much like it used to mean, even when my mom was mar uh, married, 1957, here. Remember the old uh, traditional wedding vow? Unto thee I betroth my faith. What did you promise? My commitment, my allegiance, my loyalty. And nobody had to ask, what do you mean by that? Also, no one said, oh, they can't do that. We believed, we still do, when a couple gives their loyalty to each other, that we deep down know what that means, and we also deep down believe it can be done. And we honor those who do it over many years, right? So faith in our verse means, because it meant to Paul and his audience, it means allegiance, faithfulness, or loyalty, okay? The other word law there, again, Jews and Gentiles, they knew exactly what this meant. Back in the days of the Bible, deeds of the law were those things that, can I make you guys the Jews? These are the things that you would do that were different from them. So kosher eating habits, Sabbath observance, following uh, feast seasons, circumcising your young boys, 
There were a host of things that made you Jewish. They were called the deeds of the law, which, by the way, you guys looked at sometimes with respect. You understood how Jews acted. That's what they did. At the same time, you weren't quite convinced that you wanted to do it. And so you hear in the New Testament a lot of these proselytes. They would come into the church and they would say, well, I'd like to join you. This side would say, well, be Jewish. This side would say, but I don't want to be. I've got my family background, my tribal history. That's the problem here. But he's, uh, so now let's read our verse with this understanding in mind. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified, Paul said, considered right in the sight of God by faithfulness to God and not by keeping Jewish traditions. That's what he meant by this verse. And you can see the sparks flying. You are hitting at the base of where the early church is going to have its, its problem. So now what we're going to do is just move our way through the verses. I think you're going to find them to be pretty commonsensical. I'll just pause between each one and see how you're doing and see if I can make sense of them with you. Verse 29. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes. He is the God of these people over here too. Verse 30, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Of course, circumcision keys off that Jewishness. This seems to be just Paul's playful way of using the same idea with two different very syn uh, near synonyms. He's basically saying faithfulness to God is all you need outside of Jewish tradition. And he's saying it in two simple ways. Or using the same idea twice. Verse 31. To this point, by the way, the Gentiles are excited because they get to live out their Christianity with all those, with, without those Jewish traditions. Probably meaning, in the back of their mind, that means I can throw away my Bible. Because that's where all those Jewish traditions were taught. My Old Testament. So verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Now Paul's got to figure out how to keep this side happy because now they have to take their Old Testament seriously and this side, you're rooting Paul on. Of course we keep the Old Testament serious. Verse 1 of chapter 4. There were no chapter breaks, so Paul is just continuing his thought. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? What Paul does immediately is drop into, well, two quick examples. The two probably paramount examples of Old Testament living, Abraham, the founder of, of Judaism, and David, the great poet theologian, responsible for many of our Psalms. Two famous Jews. And he's simply saying, guys, let's use these two famous stories to quell any possible arguments that you guys might have. Verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he has something to boast about but not before God. Conceptually doing things by itself doesn't count for much with God. Have you ever noticed that? The more you grow in your Christian faith, you realize that if you, that if you do things out of duty, I think God yawns sometimes and says, well, thank you. Duty's good, but that's not how you function to get on my good side. I've got a, a friend at work. He's an atheist. When he got married and they had a child last year, he, had, he told me over lunch that he was going to baptize his baby. And I said, but you're an atheist. And, and he said, I know, it's my grandma. I'm trying to please my grandma. And uh, then he said these words, and I even wrote them down because they were, I thought, brilliant. If there was a God, he wouldn't much be interested in me hedging my bets. And I said, at least you're honest. Thank you. So even the world knows even atheists know if there was a God and you could just get on his good side by doing things, that's not much of a God. That's not how people are. So why would God do that? That's all he's saying in verse 2. Verse 3, for what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. This is a quotation out of a very famous verse in Genesis 15, which shows how early this idea was taught in the biblical story. The word believed there is the verbal form of the noun faith. It's the same exact word. So you could read it this way and be fair to the text. Abraham loyaled himself to God. 
Out of all the gods he had in his home area of Babylon, he loyaled himself to one. His name was Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, and for that reason alone, he became, in God's sight, righteous. So Paul is simply saying, see how early and see how foundational this idea of loyalty to God works. Verse 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. In other words, on the other hand, trying to do things just to get God's approval gets nowhere fast. We all know that. Verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes, there's that verb form again of loyalty, but loyals himself to God, or the one who justifies the ungodly. Ungodly is a term that Paul had always used for this side over here. You guys were the ungodly because you were traditionally outside of the pale of what it meant to be a follower of God. So when he says ungodly, he's talking about the Gentile. So imagine how, again, this would sound to you. But to him who does not work, but loyals himself to him who justifies the Gentile, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Verse uh, 6. Now David, we all know David to be, by the way, how are you doing? Is this making sense? If if, uh, Phoebe were to stop and say, any questions? If you've ever been part of a Jewish synagogue or seen how they act, the the idea of a sermon, a 30-minute monologue, that's relatively recent. It goes back to the Puritan era. Before that, world history knew nothing of this. It was always very conversational, very interruptive. So I guess we don't have to be interruptive here unless you want to be. But um, that's what they were used to. So my guess is that during the reading of this, there were questions going on and bad looks crossing the aisle left and right. How was David, what what was his reputation in the Bible? It was a guy who loyalty was his word, right? He was a man after God's own heart. And if you had ever said, David, have you ever worshipped another god? He would say, Yahweh is my shepherd. I have never wanted another. Psalm 23, 1. He was a loyalist at heart. And you never hear him in the Bible, ever, even in the worst times, ever switching his loyalty from God to another God from another nation. That's what made him so marvelous. However, one of the worst men behaviorally in the Bible is David. And if he can hear us today, I apologize, David, but your reputation precedes you. And you know that we know that you know how you fell to numerous temptations in your life. Did that make him unrighteous? No, and that's why he becomes this, again, tremendous figure to to explain this story of how righteousness works. So let's follow it here. Verse 6, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from these works, these Jewish works of the law. So it's not about behavior, never has been. Verse 7, blessed are those, and this is a quote from Psalm 32, David wrote this, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. David celebrates here the kind of God that he met in Yahweh. This is the kind of God. One who is forgiving sin, even when he's a sinner, but because of his loyalty, he found forgiveness with God. And then verse 8 This finishes up the quotation of Psalm 32. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. And again, may I take you back to the world of the Bible. The gods were not understood. When a person looked up into the starry sky at night and they imagined that that's where the gods lived, they didn't believe, in general, and I'm talking about the other nations, Moab, Ammon, Edom, and now the Roman Empire. They never thought of the gods as gracious. The gods used us. They used us as toys and, and to, to get their desires met. But when it came to being gracious to human beings, the idea that a god was gracious was very foreign to their world. So do you see how David sounds very different to the average worldview of that era? In fact, David would have known about this psalm. This is a song or a psalm called A Prayer to Any God. It's a, it is a prayer that we have uncovered in uh, the, the dust of uh, Ugarit, uh, an ancient city back in um, an area just north of Israel. 
It's a prayer, and I'm just going to read a part of it. And again, it predates David. So David may have heard this, this prayer. It starts this way. It's called a prayer to any God. Every day worship your God. Sacrifice and benediction are the proper accompaniment of incense. And then numerous lines that I'm going to leave out. But this is how the prayer ends. I wish I knew that these things were, or what things were pleasing to one's God. What is proper to oneself is an offense to one's God. What is in one's own heart seems despicable, and yet it's proper to one's God. Who knows the will of the gods of the heavens? Who understands the plans of the underworld gods? Where have mortals learned the way of a God? And that's how that prayer ends. And then compare that to David. Compare that to the Psalms where he knows what his God is like, and he celebrates again and again, and you can do this in the Psalms, a kind of God who, who forgives his own. Amazing. Verse 9. Does this blessedness, the blessedness of having your sins forgiven, then come upon the circumcised only, you guys, or upon the uncircumcised also, you guys? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. So what is important to understand here in this forgiveness of sins thing, by the way, is... And again, here's where I think the Christian traditions have sometimes uh, gotten us off moorings. We've often, we've sometimes, well, in my hearing, we've used forgiveness of sins as the way into Christianity. And we'll say getting saved means to ask God to forgive us. That's backwards to Paul. Paul would say, as we just are seeing here, be loyal to the right God. And forgiveness comes as a privilege once you're loyal. See that uh, difference? Forgiveness isn't the doorway into Christianity. It's the furniture of the house called Christianity. It's something we enjoy because we are believers in our God. Verse 10. Well, then, how was this blessedness of forgiven sins accounted? And, how it, and I'm going to move faster because he just starts thinking through the story of Abraham, which you can do as well. While he was circumcised or uncircumcised. Am I in the right verse, Ten, Good, thank you. Yeah, we're back to Abraham, by the way. That's where we're going. While he was circumcised or uncircumcised. Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. The story of Genesis has Abraham becoming a Jew after he becomes loyal. Well, that switches things up and makes the Gentile kind of happy. Verse 11. And he received, uh, Abraham did, the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of the faith. Now, again, read that as loyalty, and you'll be consistently help, helping yourself understand the story. A seal of the righteousness of the loyalty which he had while he was still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe. Are you hearing that over there, guys? Um, Though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Verse 12. I think you can see where he's going with all these ideas, putting them into one long description. Verse 12, and the father of circumcision to those who are not only of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. A Gentile can walk in the steps of Abraham, even though he's not circumcised, you see, because he would simply be loyal to the same God that Abraham was loyal to. Verse 13, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world, remember that promise made to Abraham, was not to him or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, getting into the timing of law, Ten Commandments, Sinai. And again, we're, he's kind of bringing that story of the order of events of the Old Testament to bear, saying, when did Abraham get righteous? Before the whole Moses story ever got off the ground, which is really going to, again, mess with the idea that you have to have law in order to get righteous. That was never the point of it. Verse 14. For if those who are of the law, that's you guys, if you're observing it to get right with God, possibly, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Verse 15. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Paul sometimes does this. He'll back out and make a, per, a proverbial statement or a truism to say, well, guys, let's think about this. Why would you have a law about anything? It just says don't. And don't doesn't measure maturity very, very well. 
It doesn't measure relationship. Just because you go the speed limit, that doesn't mean you're getting along with your governor, right? There's no relationship between obedience and personal relationship. And Paul's just making that point, that laws never helped anyone be righteous, and they're not designed to. Good point, Paul. 16, therefore it is of faithfulness. The whole story of faithfulness works because that it might be according to grace. Grace is that beautiful word meaning God gets to be nice to you because you're loyal to him. Beautiful idea. So that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only of those who are of the law, you guys, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, you guys, who is the father of us all, everyone in the room. There we go again. By the way, the gospel is inclusive, do you notice? Not because all get saved, but all can be. It is, for the first time in world history, open to any race, any creed, any tribe. This is the first attempt, again, in world history at this sort of idea. By the way, again, my title, the greatest idea among all great ideas. This is the great idea. We've got to get to a greater idea even than this. It's coming. Verse 17, as it is written, I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they do. For time, we're not going to get into it, but that's probably the story of Abraham being old, being told he was going to have a baby, Sarah being 10 years younger, but still very old. That story took a lot of faithfulness, and, Paul, and, and Abraham made his way through it. So let's just read how Paul brings this back to our memory, verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Paul is giving a wink here to this side being descendants of Abraham. You really are, even though you don't necessarily know it. 19, and not being weak in faith, there's that word again, loyalty, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. And let's do the next three verses, just one after the other. Verse 20. He, Abraham, did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, disloyalty, but was strengthened in loyalty, giving glory to God, and being, 21, being fully convinced that he, that what God he had promised, he was able to do. And therefore it was accounted, verse 22, to him for righteousness. So what Paul is simply doing is saying this idea of faithfulness leading to righteousness, how far back does it go? To the very beginning. We're not doing anything against our Bible by just bringing it all together, making one big story, and trying to get you guys to see how you guys, and back and forth we can agree to be in the same room. 23, and again I'll just finish up the verses of chapter 4. Now it was not written for his sake alone. Here now Paul is, in a sense, speaking 2,000 years later to you and I. Here's where he gets very practical. Verse 24, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us, righteousness, being right with God. To us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now again, you're in Rome, 1,400 miles away. It only happened 25 years ago. And you're telling your friends and neighbors that you worship Jesus of Nazareth. Their first point will be he was a guy who was crucified by the Roman government. And you're going to have to say this is the hardest thing for the human to believe. Jesus resurrected. And I know we just say it. It comes off our lips. But imagine. I remember when uh, Ethel Matson was buried right or I was at the funeral for Grandma. And there was the casket. I was sitting right there. And I was young, and it was kind of freaky to see someone who had died I hadn't seen. From what I remember, that was the first dead person I had ever seen. Tell that boy sitting there that that person will get up. And even if they're uneducated and young and inexperienced, they would say, no, that doesn't happen. In other words, it's the one thing that humans have always believed is final, and that is death. So you see how verse 24 goes. We are being loyal to him who raised up Jesus. God is going after the hardest possible thing to believe. He wants you to believe because that's how this faithfulness works. Okay, Just so you see 
where he's going. Verse 25, who was delivered up, Jesus was because on or account of our offenses, and was raised because of or in the interest of our justification. All right, so that's the idea of chapter 4. Is there even, one even more amazing idea than the idea that we can get everyone together in the same room to worship one Savior? Okay, to do this, let me take you to Romans 14 briefly and I'll close. Between chapter 4 and chapter 14, there's a lot of things going on in Paul's argument, but the basic point is, and let me repeat something that came back in chapter 12, not on the screen. Be of the same mind one toward another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for... It sounds like he's, he's aware of a small town church. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. That's right in Romans. Talking to people who should be getting along just fine, but they're not. And now you know why they weren't. All right, chapter 14, verse 19. Let's finish with the end of chapter 14. Here's what he says. Let us therefore pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify another. Okay? Come on, guys, you can do this. Verse 20. Do not destroy the work of God. That is you guys. Hillman's reputation is the work of God in Mora, right? Going back dozens, hundreds, I don't know how old you are. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. What is that? Kosher. No shellfish. I would never eat pork. I eat it all the time. What are you doing? Why would you, for over, a, over a potluck meal downstairs, destroy what's going on here? All things indeed are pure but to the evil man, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. 21. Here's Paul's opinion. It is good neither to eat meat or drink or do anything by which your brother stumbles or offended or is made weak. You know what I would do? I would put away the poor guys for their sake. Can you do it at home? Now, I think that's possible. Oops, I'm sorry. I think that's possible. He, in other words, don't do it in front of them, okay? And guys, don't you do your stuff, your Sabbath keeping in front of them. If they ask you to move your refrigerator, their refrigerator on Saturday, help them. I know you don't do it, but mm, do as much as you can to get along. How do we know that he wasn't talking all the time? The next verse, 22. Do you have loyalty? Here's the question of the hour. The whole book's about this. Are you loyal to Jesus? And don't say you don't know what loyalty is. You heard weddings. Unto thee I betroth my faith. You didn't stop the couple or sneer at them for not defining loyalty because deep down the human condition knows what loyalty is and that's what marriage is. You know when you're loyal or not, right? And Paul is just pleading with these, peoples, these people. Do you have loyalty? You better settle that because that's how you become a Christian. So if you ever wondered, how do I become a Christian in the Bible? You love Jesus Christ. And you say to him, I want to be yours. I want to be your person. I'm loyal to you. That's faith in the Bible. So it's not a difficult, but nor is it defined often where people want it to be. And sometimes when people want that definition, I'm wondering, why? Why do you need a definition? Why, why can't it just be what it is? Because that's usually how it works. All right, so do you have faith? Here it is. Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. So the great idea in the biblical story that is now coming to what I would call the greatest idea in the history of ideas is in the last verse of Romans 14. And before it's on the screen, don't put it there, thank you. <laughs> Jeff, I appreciate that. Do you see how the great idea of worshiping one person with two backgrounds, two family, two tribal tr traditions has caused a lot of problems. It's like God knew what he was doing. He was putting people in a position that they would be upset with each other because he purposely brought two groups of people together who fought tooth and nail for centuries, if not millennia, right? So how would Paul solve, or let's say it this way, and I, to me, in my opinion, this is the first time in world history that this idea has ever been proffered to anyone. It's in Romans 14, 23. All right, go ahead and put it on. 
But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from loyalty. For whatsoever is not from loyalty is missing the mark. All right, here's what I want you to do. Be loyal to Jesus, and let that be enough. Now, someone in the room is going to say, but Paul, you're setting this up for immaturity. Someone in the room is going to blow this, because immature people love to play with rules. And Paul would say, I know. That's how rules are. Immature, deviant people will always find a way around them. I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to you. Here's what I want you to do. Ask yourself the next time you're going to do something. Now, here's where I can bring it to us today. Ask yourself, should I blank? Simple question. Am I doing this out of loyalty to Jesus? If I'm not, then don't do it. Wow. I had never, again, I, when I came to this even in my own study a couple years ago, I remember saying to myself, can it be that simple? And if I complain to Paul in abstentia, say, Paul, it, that's too simple. I think he would say, Ron, you don't understand how big Jesus is. You don't understand how great Jesus is. You don't understand how magnificent the person of Jesus can be to a group of people. I think Paul smiled when people said, I don't know if we can do this. And he said, well, yes, there's nothing that can keep wicked and immature people from abusing loyalty, the concept. Some people will always figure out a way to, uh, to use and abuse laws. In fact, and I've been here too, and you may have heard, I'm not, I'm not a good joke teller, but I'm, I'm almost done. So let me give you one joke because it, it does fit the scene. Or it answers to me how this works. I grew up as a Baptist pastor's kid, so I, I, I uh, know how churches work. Um, so a guy is being rescued off a desert island after many years. His rescuers are amazed at all the work he's put into 20-some years on this island alone. He almost has a ho- uh, like, a, like a city. So yeah, that's my, that's my house. That's my gas station. That's my grocery store. That's my summer house, way over there. And as they get on the boat, they say, what's that house way over there? He says, well, that's the church I used to go to. It, 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 yeah, see, I can't tell jokes very well. It's, it's in, the, it's in the, 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 the mind of the normal person to not get along. We, we, we're very good at that, and I think Paul knew that. So what is the greatest idea in the history of ideas? Here it is. And I say it to you as a church. I'm also going to subtitle my sermon, The Best Gift You Can Ever Give to Your Pastor. The one you're going to get. Jesus is enough. If you can believe that personally and believe that across the aisle, that's where you have come upon the greatest idea that has ever been thought of, probably not been tried, because we're afraid to try it. But that's where Paul is asking us to go. Do you believe that Jesus is enough? Let's pray as we close. Father, our thanks to you. I personally thank you for this church, the history it brings to this area, the people that have made it so. I ask for the future of this group, this people. It is a, it is a work of God, to, to quote Paul, and we value it for that. And I ask that they believe and put into play, put into practice, and enjoy the idea that Jesus is enough. May you bless them in that endeavor in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.